Hi everyone, it's Ari here. I wanted to give a few comments on a company that I came across called uh, Hornbeck Offshore Services. And this company is in the, they own ships, they own vessels that, that bring equipment and, and crew and, and so forth and drilling it like such as drilling equipment to the to areas in the Gulf of Mexico to drill for oil. So they're they're related to the uh, offshore oil industry. And they've, uh, you know, I, I came across them because I saw, <clears throat> I know this, this, the shipping sector in general is in distress. Oil is in distress, offshore is in distress. But, uh, you know, th these, this company had, was trading at a very, very low uh, book price to book value and I therefore wanted to look into it some more and I, I don't like this I'll just be upfront I don't like this idea as much as I like some of my other ideas that I talk about like intrepid potash but you, they are managers who are buying this company so you can see here the insider purchases in in January when the price of oil hit a low and there was a lot of distress in general you saw <clears throat> there were some there were some buying in this area and now the price is hitting a new low so I, I always like to if a price hits a, a further low below management buying I always like to look a little bit deeper because it seems like the market is disagreeing with with man, maybe manager expectations that said the the, this whole industry is suffering from a critical oversupply condition. You have too many of these ships or vessels, and um, therefore the day rates or the rental rates to to hire these vessels has decreased dramatically. Uh, sometimes it's below break-even costs, so you're running your vessels. It's more more expensive to run your vessels than to just stack your vessels. Uh, but but because of debt, people generally have to be generating cash flows, so they're they're willing to run their vessels perhaps at unsustainable rates just to generate enough cash to service their debt. And the, I don't like this industry because also you have very low barriers to entry, so anyone or any company could acquire ships, and and that's exactly what happened. You have an overbuild situation now. And that when it, when people can build ships and 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 compete with you, they're going to drive away your ability to make an economic profit. So this is a great cyclical company. So if oil does in fact spike because low prices now predict high prices in the future, then there may be a this this is trading. This has a book value, for example, of about forty dollars a share, and it's trading at four dollars a share. So there could be substantial swing here. And maybe this is a way to bet on oil, but uh, again, I don't really like the industry because you have very low barriers to entry, and it's highly dependent on the price of oil. But at some prices, everything can become attractive. So right now, again, you're trading at four sixty-two, and it's it's got a book value of around forty. We can see that if we just go to the balance sheet, you take equity. Uh, 1440 divided by the uh, shares outstanding, which is 36.31. You get, uh, yeah, pretty much exactly $40. And if we look at the what's in there, there's no goodwill. Uh, well, they don't show it here, which is unfortunate. So let's go to the 10Q. Sometimes Google Finance doesn't show you all the information, so it's always important to actually check the filing. I just like the Google Finance for visual display, but here we go. So you can see the PP&E, so almost all of the assets in this company is property plan equipment. And uh, I wanted to see, so now going back here, so the, the one thing is they haven't written down the value of these assets, which is, is a concern because, so if we look at annual data, <clears throat> they haven't really written down the value of their ships, despite the fact that oil prices have plummeted. So I do think 
another thing I don't like about this company is I think that the management haven't been very honest about the value of their ships. But that said, they, they seem to have conducted fair market value tests and don't see a need to write it down. But I, I just don't, I don't follow because they, they've stacked a large amount of their ships. So <laughs> probably the PP&E should have been written down. But still, they would have to write it down 90% in order to sort of be in, in the line with the current market price. Um, the other thing we can see here is that they have, or we can go to the queue, you can see that they have <clears throat> long-term debt, debt of a one one point, like about a billion dollars, and they have a, and they have cash equivalents of about two hundred twenty-five million dollars. So relative to their assets, though, I think this needs to be written down. They are not excessively leveraged. You know, if if we wrote down the assets, two billion dollars, say, and then you have about a billion of assets, you. So if you write down asset, the whole asset, 66%, you'd still have a billion of assets, which would be, uh, you would be you know, at about 50% book leverage. So it's not crazy leveraged. And if we go to the earnings call transcript, you can see that they discuss liquidity and so they say, turning to our liquidity, we announced yesterday that we reached an agreement with our revolving credit lenders that aligns the covenant package in their undrawn facility with the current reality of their business. So what that says is they have a credit card and they had some the restrictions that governed when they can use the credit card, but because the business has now become challenged with low oil prices, they, they violated some of those restrictions on when they can use the credit card, but they've renegotiated those. So now they have a, a covenant package or a restriction that allows them to have more flexibility with the credit facility. That said, they don't really plan on using the credit facility, but it is an extra source of liquidity for them if they need it. So it says, while we haven't used the revolver we, and may never do so, we believe that it gives them access to additional liquidity. Also, they've improved their liquidity by moving out their their payments. So they have a couple of additional ships that they have ordered and they've moved out the delivery dates of those until 2018. So they've, they've for at least 2016 and 17, they've tried to push out all of their expenses and they show in their presentation, they show that they have a, they show, so their presentation is a great way to see an overview of their business. I was going to say they show that they pushed out the, they have a maturity date. I think the first maturity is 2018, but we can check that in a second. So they're mostly in the Gulf of Mexico and you can kind of see what they do. They have equipment here that helps the people drill and deep explore for deep water oil. And this, this will probably be an important source of oil. I don't doubt that, but the question is really, can investors make money? In this industry and like Buffett says no one really made money in airlines and no one has really made money in autos in aggregate and so it's really tough I think to see how these companies are going to make money in aggregate in this sector because of the low barriers to entry but that said we are in a very unique period where in general everyone is trading at a very low price and so there could be a there could be an opportunity to enter at an attractive enough price to actually make a reasonable return. But I, you know, in terms of sizing, I would keep this at a smaller position. Um, they're talking about their fleet here. They have a lot of new ships, and what's one of their one of their highlight points is that they have a lot of Jones compliant ships. I don't know if they have a slide on this. Um, I'll just leave it out here. So they have a lot of Jones compliance ships, which means so there's an act that requires that all trade in the Gulf of Mexico sort of be on you between on U.S. ships, U.S. crewed ships, and and so if you want to bring equipment from the shore to your platform, you if you hire a Jones Act ship, a qualified ship, then you can just use that ship to bring the goods from the shore to the platform. But if you 
don't use a Jones Act ship, then you have you have to hire two vessels: one to bring the, the equipment, and then another a vessel with a foreign maybe another vessel to install it. So the Jones Act having Jones Act qualified ships is an advantage for this company, but that's an advantage that's regulatory based and obviously the people who are at a disadvantage relative to that act are, are lobbying to get the act repealed. So um, I'm still not very convinced that this industry has great economics overall. They talk about how they earn higher margins than their peer groups, uh, which is good, suggests that they're better run. And they really do a good job talking about why they think their business is a compelling investment. Um, <clears throat> here they're showing historical EPS and they're, they explain why some of the variation in the EPS over time and then they have a low case, mid case, and high case. So yeah, if, if, if the market recovers you could see a very substantial increase in their EPS and just the relaxation of distress increase in EPS could, could obviously move this price up very high. So I think the most important question here is, do they have the ability to survive the liquidity? We just I just told you that they seem to have improved their liquidity and they don't have that much leverage uh, relative to some of the other like onshore companies I've looked at. And if we look at the yeah, so no maturities of any debt until 2019, so not 2018, 2019, 2020, and 21. So they have a couple of years of window, and and oil has been low for quite a while now. Again, Russia and Saudi Arabia have no interest in giving away their oil at low prices forever. And I think they have they are, and the other OPEC-related countries are interested in reaching an agreement. And... Iran has been had some time to ramp up their production levels, so I think we are going. We're getting into the world where people are going to start cooperating in order to achieve higher prices. And and people say, well, why, if they restrict supply, then they lose market share. But you don't want to give away all of your oil assets for very low prices and keep your market share when you could restrict price, actually earn a little bit higher return and lose some market share because the oil sector in the United States isn't going away. It's just going to get more and the, the technology is just going to improve and the cost of extraction is just going to decrease. So there's not really much benefit long term to restricting the price today except for the fact that it delays the big capex investments. So I don't really think they're going to help choke they're they're not going to permanently choke off the the onshore oil sector in the United States the fracking because that's a low cost anyone in their backyard could set up a pump and and then sell the oil that's swing swing capacity but by delaying the big projects from the chevrons or the bps then exxon mobiles then you could you could actually move prices long term, but I and I, you know, I think that's already underway. So, so I don't think the incentives are to keep oil prices low for much longer. They say they have strong asset coverage relative to their debt. That's true, except for the fact that they've stacked most of their ships. Uh, they say here is they say the FMV, the fair market value of their ships, which is this this one. Is quite high relative to like the market value today of the ships, but like the the market stock price market value versus the appraisal value, you could say. But again, I'm not so I'm not so convinced about that number. Um, yeah, so it, I wanted to show you. So pretty much what they're doing now is. They are stacking all of their ships. Where is that picture? Like this. And what that does is it minimizes their costs. So they don't have as much cost on a day-to-day -day basis and they have less wear. 
costs maybe about five hundred to a thousand five hundred dollars to to store these ships, but um, it's means that the ships aren't being used, the technology is becoming more outdated, and they already say that they've stacked their fair share of ships. If we look at their, you know, um, yeah, you know, we've done our more than our fair share, having stacked over seventy-five percent of their fleet. In contrast, they don't think that their competitors have done so. So, within this space, this company does seem to be more conservative, and I would want to bet on a more conservative company than a more aggressive company, given the bankruptcy risk. But I think the problem is again, the only way for an industry like this to right size is for companies to go bankrupt, and then for their ships to be permanently idled, like scrapped, uh, and sold for parts, because or or they i guess they could be acquired and then scrapped or or stacked but you're not going to have an arrangement like opec here or you're not going to have an arrangement like in in the potash industry that i talk about in my other videos where you have a few players a few major players who can restrict supply um, here it's not really that way so you're not going to see the industry take care of itself the only way this will improve is if oil prices improve and activity increases, uh, which which makes me concerned. So I would, I I think this company is interesting. I would like to see the management buying more of the of the stock. They did buy again in the seven eight dollar range. Now it's at four sixty. So I would like them to buy some more as a vote of confidence in the business. And but just you know, my check is they're they're trading at a substantial discount. If the market turns, you're able to buy today the ships. You get almost seventy five percent of their ships, for example, for, for like free, and you pay for the active ships today. I think that the management seem to be pretty straightforward. They seem to be have an investor mindset, as I showed you from the presentation. They're they're emphasizing metrics that investors care about, and. They seem to have improved their liquidity and they've done their fair share of stacking. And again, I don't think crude prices can stay low for much longer. Uh, I don't think the incentive is there to keep it low for much longer. So this is an interesting stock, I, I'll say, to keep on your radar. I, I wanted to make some points about the industry as a sort of lesson point. And I think this may be worth a a small position in a, in a sort of oil related part of your portfolio. Uh, but I don't think we've hit bottom, bottom and I and even the CEO folks say it, they don't think they hit bottom. I don't think we are at the bottom yet in the market for these ships. So um, So there may be some more time to watch, but I think it takes a couple of months to get to learn about a company. So this is something, this is an example of one of these companies that you may want to learn more about. Thank you for your time.